Hello. Welcome to the second annual Create Encounter release party. My name's Maria Payne, um, and I uh, established Create Encounter last year for my internship project with Rehumanize International. Um, Create Encounter merges life and art with honest and emotional tributes to the many issues surrounding human dignity and life. So first up tonight is our first place prose winner, Lauren Pope, who will be reading her piece, Crossing Over. The judges were impressed by the truthfulness and timeliness of the subject matter she explores in her piece. Okay, Lauren. <laughs> Is this okay? Can everyone hear me okay? Okay. All right, so I'm just gonna jump right in then. A little closer? Is that better? Oh, I'll switch. Okay. <laughs> All right. Ani's Friday shift was going well. It was 7 a.m. and our patrons had consisted mostly of old men who sat in the corner drinking coffee and spreading local gossip. They were content with fresh coffee every 20 minutes and a smile. So, when Mauricio walked to the door, she had to stop herself from audibly groaning. He was accompanied by several of his crew, and they were all obviously hungover or still drunk. Some local girls hung off one of the cronies, but Ani couldn't tell if they were enjoying themselves or just resigned to being there and doing an admirable job of hiding their fear. Mauricio grabbed Ani's butt as she came to take the order. Not even a quick pat or a squeeze. He put his hand on her like he owned her. She cringed but continued writing. She hoped he wouldn't take her lack of open revulsion as permission and slipped away as quickly as she could. When she came back with the food, she was greeted with spilled coffee and a pile of crumpled napkins. A few of the gang had dispersed and only Mauricio and someone whose name she could never quite remember were still at the table. A bathroom, Mauricio grunted in explanation. Ani thought it was a bit early in the day for drugs, even for this bunch, but shrugged and arranged the table. Mauricio placed his hand on her arm as she worked. She flinched without thought causing him to let out a booming laugh and exchange some crude gestures with his friend. Ani blushed and pulled away. She gathered her composure and refilled the old men's coffee. Thankfully, none of them were grabby. The rest of the service was pretty uneventful. Mauricio's crew actually paid their bill and left a few coins on the table for her trouble. She got in things prepped for lunch without much problem and only needed to take out the trash before she could start her two mile journey home. The dumpster wasn't lo located directly behind the restaurant it was down a weird curving alleyway that seemed intentionally designed to allow for ambush from some seedy coke fiend. The staff usually had a buddy system for going back there, but the dishwasher was still up to his elbows, so Ani risked going out herself. She turned the first corner and heard a voice. Ani. Before she could process it, his arms were around her waist. She recognized him immediately. Mauricio. He stunk of alcohol and something else. Mauricio, she stumbled for words. I I need to take this to the dumpster. He knocked the bag out of her hands while pulling her closer to her body. To his body, sorry. I'm Catholic. He laughed. She knew it was coming, but tried her best to push him away, repeatedly telling him no and hoping that someone would hear her come and come. No one did. He laughed again when he was finished, and he just left. He left like it was nothing, like he had gone out for a smoke and needed to catch the rest of a game. Ani looked at the ground. The bag had torn where he'd thrown it. She ignored the pain inside of her and bent down to gather the discarded cups and leftover bits of meat. Then she stood up and took the bag to the dumpster. She vomited. Her father accompanied her to the police station. He was in a blind rage, rage and swearing to kill Mauricio, but her mother had pleaded mercy. Justice, she had said. Ani and her father sat, sat in the sterile room together him with his face and arms stern and bulging, and her trying her best to sink into the painted walls. At last, they called her name. Detective Calise was a stout man, maybe 40. He didn't look particularly kind, but seemed competent. He diligently took notes and nodded when it was appropriate. He promised that there would be a full investigation and that he just needed to interview the accused assailant. Ani tried to ignore the disgusted look he gave her father as they walked out. A week later, they received a notice. They did not have the evidence to pursue an indictment. Her father saw one of Mauricio's men at the station. There had never been a chance. A week after that, a friendly nurse told Ani that she, the pregnancy test was positive. She cried the entire drive home. Her mothers and sisters talked in hushed voices about the situation. 
there were ways, there were people, and God would understand. Ani overheard one particularly well-constructed plan and burst into the room. It's not the rapist, baby, it's mine! Mine, mama, she sobbed. Shh, Anita, shh, her mother comforted her, shooting a warning glances at her other daughters. I know, I know, but what about Mauricio? If he knows, what will he do? Ani had been turning that over in her mind for days. There was no reason for him to see her. She hadn't been back to work, and he hadn't come to see her. She seemed content to maintain an uneasy truce in which she was forever broken, and he got away without so much as a harsh word. Perhaps she could just avoid him. She knew it was wishful thinking. He would find out. Someone would tell him. It was better she'd be the one to do it. We'll tell him here. With Papa here, he won't dare do anything. I will tell him that I want nothing from him, and that will be that. On his mothers and sisters exchanged incredulous glances. They knew there was no use trying to change her mind about it. The joke had always been that Ani was the goat. Stubborn didn't begin to describe her when she dug her in her hills. She'd once literally tackled an escaping rooster just to prove he didn't get away. And he was a pretty tasty bird. I'll tell Papa to make the arrangements, Anna's mother said. Three days later, Marisa was sitting in Mama's chair. He slumped so far into it that his head was barely above the backrest. His legs were crossed at his ankle, resting at his knee, and the light from the window was shining off his slicked-backed hair. He looked thoroughly inconvenienced. Ani took a deep breath. I need you to know, she stumbled over her breath for a few seconds, but continued. I need you to know that I'm pregnant. His inconvenience turned to rage. Get rid of it! You have to fucking get rid of it! He raised from the chair and stared, started towards her. Ani's father took a step forward, but she waved him off. Mauricio stoop, stopped, stooped, I'm sorry, stopped, <laughs> looming above her. I'm not going to do that, Mauricio. It's a human being, and I can't, I can't kill it. His eyes narrowed with contempt. You don't have to do anything. I, I won't ask for money. I won't even tell the baby that you are her father or how. Her voice trailed. Before Ani could regain her composure, he was lunging for her. He had his hands around her neck. You will get rid of it, he screamed, threading his fingers. In another second, her father was on top of him, pulling Mauricio to the ground. Ani let out a gasp of air, and her sisters rushed to her side. Her father and Mauricio were rolling around on the ground. Her father had a distinct weight advantage on Mauricio, but the younger man's blows came faster than he could block. With a scream, he slammed a fist into her father's head, slamming it back on the tiled floor. Ani heard a sickening crunch, and blood pooled in a sickening swirl. Her father stopped moving. Papa! Papa! Ani screamed. Her mothers and sisters' screams soon joined. Mauricio stumbled to his feet. He looked dazed and sickened, but still deathly dangerous. For a moment, Ani thought that he would kill them all, right then and there. But instead, he ran out the door. Ani and her mother sat sobbing at her father's feet. Malta, Ani's older sister, was the first to speak. We have to call an ambulance! Ani shook her head. He's not breathing. He, he's gone. Her mother rose to the feet and wiped her hands, wet with blood on her apron. He's gone to get his men. We have to get out before they come back. Two weeks later, Ani found herself in a cramped produce truck driving by towards Rianosa. Directly beside her sat, sat Sarah and her two-year-old daughter, Flor. Sarah had been mostly silent during the trip, but as they got closer to the border, she began to open up. Her husband, Annabel, was a police officer in Guatemala City until someone came to their house one evening and shot him before burning the house to the ground. Once the news of his death had reached her, Sarah knew that she was also in danger and fled with Flor. They'd been on the road for three weeks. Flor cried constantly for her papa. He was a good man. Sarah repeated that mantra all the time. A good, decent man. Anna's nausea made her condition obvious, and she soon shared her story with Sarah. Days passed with little food or water. People were pulled off the truck and beaten and abandoned if they couldn't continue to pay the fees the men asked for. Ani was thankful that she could pay and prayed for everyone she saw tossed aside. Flora ceased crying and simply whimpered in her mother's arms. The plan for both women was to arrive at the Pida de Jesus Meja and prepare for their cases. This transport would get them into the city, and from there they'd take a bus. When they actually arrived at the station, it was the dead of night, and none of the buses were running. Ani and Sarah slept in ship. Just before dawn, a man came up with a gun demanding money. They gave all they had. Sarah said nothing. Ani and Sarah prepared over the bus map. The best option would put them about five miles out. 
When the bus arrived, Ani paid their fare with her mother's ring she'd sewn into her skirt. Something about losing it, the heat, and the pregnancy made her nearly faint, but she managed to smile and wink at Floor as they sat down. Saira mouthed a thank you that didn't seem enough. Ani replied with a wave, more lighthearted than she felt. De nada. The driver smirked and tapped the ring as they got off. Ani powered on her phone for the first time in three weeks. She saw a rush of messages from her family. Her father's body had been found. Marisa had been arrested, but immediately released. They were safe at Tio Jorge's, and then nothing else. She decided not to risk a response until she was safely across the border. Instead, she punched in the address to the shelter and mapped a path. Flor, in her colorful sandals, only lasted an hour before Ani and Sara needed to alternate carrying her. While they walked, Tia Ani told her stories about the adventures they would have when they finally arrived in America. That made her giggle, a sound that Syrah had almost forgotten on their journey. Finally, they arrived at the shelter. There were showers and real food. Simple cots were set up in cozy room, and Ani and Syrah could finally relax. The next day, someone came to help prepare their cases. Syrah had a decent level of documentation. Flora's birth certificate, as well as her own, Annabelle's service records, and a newspaper clipping announcing his death. Ani had only her ID and her pregnancy as proof of her situation. The advocate told her that her case would be harder, but that she would fight for her and try to gather any additional information on her father's murder. A week later, they approached the border. There was a crowd of people at the port of entry, more than the advocate had ever seen before. Maria, they're turning everyone away, shouted a stout priest. They say it's full. America is full. Maria turned to her clients. We'll try. For six days, they spent their days camped at the border. Every so often, a few people would be shuffled through, and at last, it was finally their turn. Maria gave the woman the contact information for her liaison across the border, hugged them, and gave Flora a kiss on the head. Be well, she said. Maria had explained that they would spend two or so nights in the icebox for processing. Afterwards, they'd be given a return date for their credible fear interview. Sarah's cousin would drive down from San Antonio to pick them up and to stay with her family while their cases worked their way through the court. So, when an American agent took them in a dark van, they had a little worry about what was to happen. Flora gave her mother a frightened look, and Sarah smoothed her hair. Shh, little brush, it's going to be okay. We just have to be brave for a little longer. They arrived at the processing center. A rough man threw the door open and grabbed Flora by the arm. She screamed. We're taking her for a shower and de-lousing. She'll be returned after processing. No, shouted Sarah. She's clean. She's had showers every day. She needs to stay with me. I'm still nursing her. The man said nothing and slammed the door. You're going to the women's building, the driver grunted. Sarah was hysterical, but Ani held her hand. It's okay. She'll, she'll be right back with you. It's okay. Ani couldn't quite make herself believe the words she said. The van stopped, and they were marched into the building. Inside, there was a huge open area enclosed by a fence. There were women everywhere. Some were crying. Others stared blankly into space. The drivers pushed Ani and Syrah through the gate. A woman, mad with grief, sat sobbing several yards away. They took them! They took them! Ani walked over to her. Who? Who did they take? My babies! They took my babies three days ago! They took my babies, and no one will tell me where. Sarah and Annie sat in a small cell with two other women. It had been months since the man had taken Flora away. Annie was round in belly, but sunken everywhere else. Her once vibrant red hair was brittle and falling out. They'd asked for vitamins, but they were given none. Her only checkup had been a single doctor's visit two months earlier. She'd heard her baby's heartbeat and smiled at its strength. Now she felt its kicks and had secretly decided it was a girl. She named her Ava. Sarah doted over Annie. She made sure she always ate the larger share and had enough water. Ani, in turn, kept Sarah's spirit up about being reunited with Flor. Sarah had spoken to Flor only once, a month after the separation. Flor had only cried mama. The woman's rosaries had been taken by the agents as a strangulation hazard, but they'd scratched some semblance of one on the floor and prayed it constantly. This day, Ani woke up in a pool of blood. She screamed, and Sarah ran to her side. Can you feel her kick? Ani laid still. A flutter came from her belly, and she almost cried in relief. Yes, but something's wrong, Sarah. Something's ho horribly wrong. Sarah screamed for a guard. After ten agonizing minutes, a tall, thin man came into their cell. She's bleeding out, shouted Sarah. She needs a doctor, now! The man shrugged and turned around. He didn't say anything. Sarah turned towards Annie, who was clutching her belly. He's going to get someone. I'm, I'm sure of it. 
Annie moaned. The contractions were starting. The other women jumped into action. One of them was gathering blankets, and the other was examining Annie's face. She's too pale. I think it's the placenta. They need to take the baby now. Help, please, help, shouted Sarah. No one came. Annie moaned in agony for five hours, and no one came. The woman who had gathered the sheets had designated herself the honorary midwife. She had five children of her own. It's almost time, she said. No one had asked Annie about feeling movement in hours. They were afraid of the answer. Blood was everywhere. At last, Ava was born. She had a full head of black hair and Annie's nose. She was completely still. Annie was barely conscious. Why isn't she crying? She sobbed. No one spoke. Why isn't she crying? The midwife looked down sadly at Annie. She placed little Ava's body in her arms. I'm so sorry, sweetie. Annie held her silently and brushed her hair away from her eyes. Beautiful. Then Annie laid her head back on the pillow and said nothing else. We have to stop the bleeding, the woman said, working furiously to press on Annie's belly. We have to get the placenta out. They worked for over 30 minutes and were finally successful. And the bleeding didn't stop, and Annie's pulse became undetectable. Cyrus sat with her back against the bars and sobbed into her hands. An hour later, a guard came to serve dinner. Seeing the blood, he ran for the doctor. Hours too late, a young man, not even 30, entered their cell. It looked like a murder scene. It was. He pronounced Ani and baby Ava dead, and then turned and walked away. Okay. <laughs> Now, Maria Oswald will be speaking on her piece, Abort, Deport. The judges uh, were elated with the thoughtfulness and relevance of this piece, as well as how it pairs with Lauren Pope's piece, Crossing Over. Hi, guys. Um, OK, so my piece is the triptych on the back table over there. Um, it's the three panels, so I was just going to kind of walk through what's on the three panels and what inspired that. Um, so the first panel, starting on the left, um, is a map of the U.S.-Mexico border, and it's got what looks like blood but is red hair dye um, traced along the border, and it says babies are murdered here, um, referencing the, I guess, kind of infamous pro-life signs out of abortion clinics that I'm sure many of us or most of us have seen. Um, usually that's not my uh, type of sign to hold, but I, I really I have to applaud it for how provocative it is, and that was kind of the visceral emotion I was going for um, with this piece. Uh, so the center panel, there is a photo of my arms, um, and so it's got the red hair dye all over my hands and um, written on my arms is a quote from Albert Camus that says, uh, I should like to be able to love my country and still love justice. Um, and so that quote actually uh, was written by him during World War II, during Germany's occupation of France, in a letter to one of his German friends. And the full quote that he has, um, because in that letter he was kind of discussing the idea of a country being views, viewed as good or evil or right or wrong, and his full quote was, there are means that cannot be excused, and I should like to be able to love my country and still love justice. I don't want just any greatness for it, particularly a greatness born of blood and falsehood. I want to keep it alive by keeping justice alive. Um, so that was really a big inspiration for me while making this piece. Um, and additionally, a kind of smaller detail, I guess, a more subtle um, meta commentary in there. Uh, in the photograph with the arms, I've got uh, my right hand is holding one of those plastic fetal models, um, and the left hand is kind of reaching for it, and that was more of, uh, much more subtle, but more of a meta-commentary on, like, the way politics goes in this country and the way I've seen more right-wing, like, Republican politicians kind of using um, fetal, like, unborn lives and using the issue of abortion as, like, a pawn in political games and kind of holding it up as, like, using the pro-life label just to get votes while not doing anything about the violence. Um, but, yeah, and then the final panel on the right side, 
um, has a pull quote from a news article that really was like the catalyst for this piece and um, definitely does pair well with Lauren's story uh, because it was a news article from The Hill that was detailing um, the claims from a handful of pregnant women who had been detained by ICE um, and they claimed that they were denied adequate medical care. And so one woman's story in particular really stood out to me in that article. Um, and so I've got a pull quote there. Uh, and uh, essentially she was left for eight days to bleed on her own um, with no medical care while she miscarried her son. Um, she says that the officials in the detainment facility told her it was not a hospital and they were not doctors, so they weren't going to take care of her. Um, that was really the story that just kind of pushed me to make such an emotional piece, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think I really wanted an opportunity to um, show that this is a pro-life issue. Um, and I know many of you here get that, but I guess just like even to um, people who just consider like pro-life to only mean like caring if if for some people that only means caring for unborn children, like this is affecting them too. It's affecting human lives and we should care about it. So yeah, that was me just kind of grappling with all of that. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Sarah Terzo will be reading her piece, Inside the Beast, which won first place for poetry. The judges love this anti-war piece because of the symbolism that hate and revenge is a beast that swallowed our country. Yeah, that's good. Inside the Beast. When others drove with their headlights on and tied yellow ribbons onto trees, we wore black and walked to school. When torches lit and oil fields burned, when flames rose into Iraqi skies, we came together, voices shouting, no bombs, no blood for oil. In 1990, war was easy to oppose. We knew they burned cities into skeletons, left human bodies black and charred, broken-backed buildings seared hot as the sun. Hurricane winds stole breath. When the bombs thundered down louder than all reason, they left streets like tombs covered in ash. What monsters they, we said. The day was warm. The grass was innocent green. Clear skies turned black and white with smoke. Planes became guided missiles bringing death. The news showed tumbling bodies, blood on the pavement in our shining city. Darkness spread across the earth as the towers fell. A nation cried out in revenge. A million throats screamed raw, blood for blood, death for death. Good people threw down banners and enlisted. Kings and princes stoked the flames of war and the smoke got in our eyes we could not see. A carnivorous beast had swallowed us whole, we were consumed. A long time later, the shame of our hate would haunt us. War left us bereft, we saw too late. There was blood on our hands. We came to know this to understand after the hundred thousandth drop of rain soaked the soil of our victims' graves. And the one thing I wanted to say about this is that I don't know how many people are, are, young, are, old, are old enough to remember the first Gulf War, but I was in high school at that time and people were driving with their headlights on to show appreciation for the war and for the soldiers. And those of us in high school who um, wanted to oppose the war, we wore black. And we were walking everywhere to show that we weren't using oil. This is back when I could walk. So um, this was what the images was in the beginning of the poem. I think it might have gone over the heads of people who don't remember that time. But it was unique to that time and the, the things we were doing to protest. Okay. Now, Kelsey Hazard will be speaking on her piece, Dilation and Evacuation. 
The judges were elated with the piece because of the unique medium that moves the focus of abortion as a large statistic to show specific moments a human can have in a lifetime. Thank you for that kind introduction. Thank you to the entire Rehumanize International staff and of course the Create Encounter judges uh, for all of your hard work. Uh, my piece is over in that corner um, if you'd like to take a look at it and uh, until you do, my comments may not make a ton of sense. <laughs> um, but I've been asked to speak for a few minutes about both the meaning and the process behind my piece. So I'll, I'll start with the meaning. It's often difficult to comprehend the tragedy of someone dying young. Uh, to fully wrap our minds around that. Uh, the loss, of course, for the deceased person, for all of the experiences that they would have had in their lifetime, uh, but also the, the loss for the people that they, they would have act, interacted with, that they would have known, their friends, family, loved ones, and even acquaintances, all of the people that they would have touched, uh, and the loss for, for society in general. And if you can begin to grasp the magnitude of that loss, and then you try to multiply that by the tens of millions killed by abortion in the United States alone, you can't do it. It's not possible. It, it's, to, to even get close is paralyzing. And I wanted to explore that in a way that wasn't paralyzing in a way that was productive, uh, and I hope that I've accomplished that with, with my piece. Um, the process involved tearing and twisting and destroying photo negatives using Sofer forceps, um, which is a second trimester abortion instrument. Uh, naturally, I needed lots of negatives. Um, my original plan actually had been for all of the photos to be of the same person um, at different points in their lifetime. And for technical reasons, uh, that proved not to work. Um, so with the submission deadline fast approaching, I panicked a bit and reached out to the pro-life community for help. And boy, did you deliver. Um, I owe a huge thank you to everyone who donated photo negatives, uh, one of whom is here. Thank you, John, <laughs> for donating your negatives. Um, I'm actually glad that we had those technical difficulties because the final product uh, turned out to be so much better than anything I could have accomplished on my own. Um, so my final task actually is to find a home for dilation and evacuation. Uh, I, my volunteer work is with an organization called Secular Pro-Life and we don't have a physical office uh, to display this piece and of course it doesn't do any good just sitting around my house. Uh, so we are uh, actually going to raffle it off tomorrow. If you are at the conference, you can come by Secular Pro-Life's exhibit booth uh, and buy some raffle, raffle tickets. All of the proceeds will, of course, benefit Secular Pro-Life. So come on over and show your support. We really appreciate it. Uh, and again, thank you so, so much. This is a great honor. Now, Herb Garrity will be speaking on the inspiration and process of writing the procedure, which is better read um, on the page than um, spoken out loud and received. Um, we liked the procedure because it uses an experimental form to create a nice juxtaposition of the way different people see the same issue. You can find this piece on page 12 in your magazine. Um, and then Herb will be reading Scream, an honorable mention piece. Hi. Um, so I actually submitted three poems as part of a series. The first one was titled Scream, and that's the one I'm going to read today. The second one was The Procedure, which won second place. And the third was Liberation, which is back there somewhere. Um, so all of these poems, for me, really come together. Um, and I wrote them when I was sort of thinking about my place in the movement when it comes to the anti-abortion issue. Um, 
I think for a lot of us, we got our start or the first piece of pro-life propaganda we really saw was the silent scream. Um, who here has seen that movie? Yeah, it's, it's one of the first things. They show it in Catholic schools. Um, I think that's where I saw it when I was a kid. Um, and I remember it didn't really strike me. Um, I saw it, I thought it was fake. I didn't think it mattered. It wasn't my issue. I was a feminist, I was pro-choice, it didn't matter. Um, and it wasn't until I was an adult and I had come to understand what abortion was outside of the rhetoric and just at its, at its core as a medical issue that I realized how, how awful it really was. Um, so that's the, the explanation behind the procedure. Um, it's written in such a way that uh, sort of expresses how different people, pro-life or pro-choice or medical or non-medical, might end up describing what the different abortion procedures are. So um, you can see it. I don't have to explain it more. Um, so Scream was written earlier this year. Um, I don't know if you guys are on Twitter. I'm on Twitter. Please follow me. Rehumanize Herb. <laughs> Uh, please follow Rehumanize International. I'm our social media director. Um, but earlier this year, there, there was a tweet, and it really it went viral. It was by um, an abortion provider, Dr. Leah Torres. Um, and you guys might have seen it. She constantly tweets sort of these insane um, pro-choice, pro-abortion things. I think she actually identifies as pro-abortion. Um, and I mentioned one of those tweets in here. So I'm going to start reading. This is called Scream. I cannot scream. Around 3,000 babies are killed every day in this country, legally. Poisoned, starved, dismembered alive, legally. Around 3,000 human beings are poisoned, starved, or dismembered alive every day in this country, and this is legal. Our siblings, our friends, our children, gone before we even knew them. I'm not supposed to call them children, though, or babies. It's too emotional. It's manipulation. I must use facts, logic, reason, not emotion. I must not cry. I must not mourn. I cannot scream. On March 11, 2018, Dr. Torres was asked, when she lies down at night, does she hear the baby's heartbeat? Does she hear the baby's screams? No. She responded, she's better than I am when it comes to being emotional. No, with a period, without a second thought, without emotion. You know fetuses can't scream, right? See, she uses facts, logic, reason. I transect the cord first, so there's really no opportunity, if they're even far enough along to have a larynx. It's a fact. When she kills them, they cannot scream. She cuts the cord first. They cannot scream. Thank you. Next, Erin Coyle will be speaking on her artwork, primarily her second place piece, Gone Too Soon. The judges enjoyed the striking images she depicts in her work, as well as her use of color. Hi, um, it's really an honor to be here tonight. There's some really beautiful art. And I guess I just wanted to start by saying, I think it's really courageous to present art in any form that isn't pretty. I think it's courageous and bold and powerful to not be afraid to show something that doesn't give you warm fuzzies like a tranquil landscape next to a little pond and a deer because that's not what the real world is, especially the issues that we're dealing with now. Um, the two pieces that I have here today are Gone Too Soon and Married to PTSD. Um, Gone Too Soon is the piece in the back with the dove and the pregnant woman. And that piece um, speaks to everyone a little bit differently, and I love that about it. I think that's what quality art or artistic endeavors do is they reach people where they're at at the time that they are experiencing that piece. Um, this one sometimes means um, 
To some people it means the struggle um, of empty nesting when they release their children out into the big scary world. Um, for others, it represents um, every child that has been lost to the Roe v. Wade decision. Uh, to me, this piece is about my oldest daughter. Her name was Adia. And um, I, I remember when I was in high school, I believed that everyone had a right to choose for their own life. So I was pro-choice. And it wasn't until I had a child of my own and I looked into that little face and all of my hopes and all of my dreams and everything that had ever been something beautiful was right there in my arms. And then four days later, she turned blue and died in my arms. And in that moment when I felt her left me, I, I felt her leave my arms, um, it just became clear to me the sanctity of life, that every single life has value, that every human being has a right to be born and breathe air, and it changed everything for me. And I just knew I had a lot of work to do, and I had a lot of things to try and affect a change, even if I'm just that tiny little pebble in the ocean. It's still something and that you reach out to can make a difference. So this piece, the lines that follow her silhouette, is really about duality for me, because in that moment, parts of me really just wanted to go and be with her where she is. But again, I knew I had to stay, and I had a lot of work to do. So that piece right there is just, the dove is my daughter um, leaving me but also going on to a beautiful place and inspiring others with her story and what she has meant to me uh, to hopefully get them to stand up and speak up about how every single life matters. And then this other piece over here briefly is married to PTSD. Um, it's a little bit about my husband. We we were both veterans in the Army and suffered, he suffered greatly uh, four different deployments and was shot down in the fourth deployment. He's okay, um, physically he's all in one piece, but once he returned to me, it became very clear that not all of him had come home and the struggle was very visceral. So when I decided to make this piece, it was really not just about military suffering from PTSD, but also about every person who goes through a traumatic experience and how on the outside, they're completely whole, just like my husband. But on the inside, that isn't the case. And you're shattered and upside down and confused and nobody seems to understand what's going on in your head. So this piece I just did because I wanted to honor not only those who have suffered, but also the very difficult role it is to stand next to somebody who has suffered and try and love them through it, even in moments of helplessness, to just be standing next to them. So I, I hope that these pieces also speak to you in some way that is meaningful. Thank you. Now, John Whitehead will be reading his piece, Following the Bends. The judges enjoyed the well-written prose of the piece and how the world he builds encompasses many issues of human dignity. As Maria mentioned, my story is called Following the Bends. The title comes from a Cambodian proverb that reads, negotiate a river by following its bends, enter a country by following its customs. Chanlina waited until nighttime to take the files. She had worked late, staying behind after the others had left the office. This would not attract attention. She, fr she frequently worked into the evening, as Mr. E's bad health meant she had to do more for him. Also, working late allowed her to avoid her husband for a few more hours. 
When the office seemed empty, she went to Mr. E's office and logged onto his computer. This was not noteworthy either. She frequently used his computer. Someone viewing security camera footage, security camera footage would not find her presence suspicious. Although she felt lightheaded, fear, excitement, Chanlina tried to maintain a tired, bored expression for the camera as she clicked through the folders. A meeting two weeks earlier had brought her to this moment. She had left the house before sunrise, shivering and thinking of how much warmer it must be back home. She drove into work through one of Shanghai's winter rains, listening on the radio to the latest news of fighting on the central Vietnam front, and started work at her usual early hour. Mr. E had met her on the way to the senior staff meeting, hobbling and grimacing. Chanlina wondered how much longer he could get by on just a cane. The staff room slowly filled with white and gray-haired men and their assistants. Mr. Zhou, the director, arrived last, being wheeled in by one of his assistants. His eyes were bright amid his lined face. They went through the meeting's agenda quickly, and Chanlina thought the gathering was about to end when Mr. Zhou made the announcement. We have not been able to reach an agreement with the Americans about the undersea drilling. They, backed up by their government, are simply not compromising. So I've decided to send senior staff to New York to talk to them directly. Perhaps that will make an impression. The bright eyes settled on Mr. E. I've chosen E to go later this month. Chanlina glanced at Mr. E, whose expression had not changed. He had not told her this was coming. He could not be happy about this, as traveling was difficult for him. After the meeting adjourned, Mr. E took her aside. His eyebrows, still dark despite his white hair, were furrowed. This meant something important was coming. I'll need more assistance on this trip to New York than I have before. Reaching an agreement on the drilling is very important, he added, as if that were the reason he wanted assistance. And talking to Americans is much harder now than it used to be. So I would like you to come with me. Chanlina smiled and thanked him while she considered what to make of this. A business trip meant time away from the house, which was good. Also, she had never been to the United States, although the visit would naturally be a tense one. It, could, it would be cold in New York as well. She thought again of home. She remembered how the sunrise would light up the mist on the Tonle Sap River. Chanlina wondered what her mother was doing right now. Then, there in the hallway with Mr. E, the idea had come to her. Without meaning to, she had smiled more broadly. She was so close now to making it all happen. She couldn't succeed, though, if she just presented herself without having anything to offer. This was why she was in Mr. E's office now. He received technical reports, describing maintenance problems, procurement needs, other details, about all the underseas drilling equipment, including the submersibles the workers rode underwater. And Chanlina knew the company worked with the, with the People's Liberation Army Navy. She occasionally saw a naval officers meeting with Mr. Joe and Mr. Yi, although she was never invited to those meetings. The equipment probably had military uses. She had opened up documents Mr. E would need for the negotiations. She had waited until, until now to print copies so she would have a reason if anyone walked in for why she was on Mr. E's computer. Also, having these documents open was useful if the, secu if the security camera behind her could pick up the computer screen. Shifting in the chair so that her body temporarily blocked the screen, she found the folder with the technical reports. Then she switched back to the negotiation-related documents and returned to her natural position in the chair. Chanlina pretended to study the documents for a moment longer. Then she shifted again and, acting as if she were just leaning forward and resting her hand on the computer, plugged in the thumb drive. Some more pretend study of the screen, another shift, and she copied the files. Some more pretend study until the transfer completed. The transfer complete, she lingered a little longer, leaving quickly would be suspicious. Chanlina printed the negotiation documents and left the office with them and the thumb drive. Driving back to the house through the rain, she rehearsed what to say to the Americans. Sleeping on the flight from Shanghai to New York, Chanlina dreamed of her mother. 
She often did. She usually dreamed of mother, of mother amid a flock of birds, chickens or ducks or sometimes pitas. Mother might just sit among them as they clucked or chirped, or she might bat at them with her arms. Chanlina sometimes wondered if the birds were meant to be her sisters. Certainly, they made the same amount of noise. And mother would occasionally give the birds the thin smile she would always give Chanlina and her sisters when her patience was at an end. Mother had many different smiles for different moods and occasions. The best was the one she would give when genuinely pleased, a broad smile that made her whole face crinkle up like someone crumpling up a piece of cloth. That was what Chanlina dreamed of on the flight, just mother's face crinkling up and the best smile of them all. Chanlina had not seen that smile while waking for a long time. Even when she was still at home, such smiles had become rare after her father's death and all that followed. Smiles after that, she recognized as not reflecting happiness. And when mother had brought news of the offer from a man in China, an offer of marriage to her eldest daughter, an offer that could help their family, she had not smiled at all. They had to change planes in Vancouver. Mr. Yi and Chan Lina disembarked, along with a man from the security department, nicknamed Big Lin, who was there to help Mr. Yi get around. For travel, Mr. Yi had exchanged his cane for a wheelchair, and Big Lin wheeled him to the next gate, with Chan Lina following. At the gate, Chan Lina waited to take her next step. Sitting there, she saw a group of women with a man at their center walk down the concourse. The man, silver-haired and in a dark suit, leaned on a cane with one hand and on one of the women's arms with the other. The other two women carried bags. The women were well-dressed but looked odd. Their skin was so smooth and even, without marks or changes in tone. Their heads twitched slightly, and they looked so similar. Were they related? Then Chan Lina realized they were all androids. She watched as the man uttered a command in Japanese, and he and the android women turned into one of the airport shops. She sat there as a TV screen blared about naval maneuvers in the South China Sea. The Western news made it sound as if China were the one at fault, with no mention of everything the Americans were doing wrong. Chan Lina felt irritated, an odd reaction, she supposed, under the circumstances. Finally, she got up and told Mr. Yi and Big Lin that she had to use the ladies' room. Chan Lina had, early, had earlier noted the signs for a cyber cafe in the terminal. She followed the signs quickly, not wanting to be away too long. Perhaps she was being too cautious by not using her own phone, but she wanted to leave as little of a trail as possible. The cyber cafe door was shut and had a sign, temporarily closed for maintenance. She paused. Was there another one? She had to get back to her gate soon. Turning around, she noticed that the Japanese man and his androids were sitting at the gate across from the closed cyber cafe. The man was looking at his phone. Chanlina walked over to him, bowed slightly, and put on what she hoped was her most winning smile. Excuse me, sir, the man looked up. Uh, my phone, Chanlina held it up. It's not working. May I have yours? J just a moment. Her Japanese was poor, so she hoped he understood. With a slight nod, the man handed over the phone. Searching online in Japanese was not easy, and not helped by how her hand trembled slightly. This was taking too long. She had to get back to the gate. She found what she wanted, though, the address of the American Office of Foreign Missions in New York. Chan Lina memorized the address. With another smile and a thank you, she handed the Japanese man his phone. This had worked out better than she had hoped. Using a stranger's phone left even less of a trail than using a cyber cafe. As Chan Lina handed back the phone, her movement triggered the nearest android, whose head swiveled to look at her. Chan Lina looked at the symmetrical plastic face, free of birthmarks, moles, or pimples. The sunlight shining through the gate's window hit the android's eyes, making them shiny and opaque. Chanlina turned and hurried back to her own gate. New York was familiar in some ways. It had the same crowds of graying people and was cold, as expected. 
They received more stares and suspicious looks, though, which became even more intent when people heard them speaking in Chinese. When they arrived at the American company's office, they were met by a man who at first Chanlina thought might also be an android. He had the same taut, fixed face and glossy hair. When he spoke, though, he was clearly human. Hi there, good to meet all of you. Thanks so much for coming all this way so we could work this out. <laughs> I'm sorry we just couldn't offer you better weather while you were here. Oh well, what can you expect for February? I feel jealous of my old man. He lives down in the islands? He's probably at the beach right now. The guy's pushing 90 and he's still body surfing. Chan Lena found it hard to keep up with what the man was saying, but felt sure she was not missing anything important. He had that American habit of talking without really saying anything. Would that get tiresome after too long here? With introductions out of the way, the negotiations began, and the man who greeted them, along with other American businessmen, now spoke more slowly and seriously. Mr. E handled the talks well, as he always did. He could seem friendly and reasonable while giving little away. As in past talks with Americans, he claimed Chanlina's English was better than his and occasionally asked her to translate something so he had more time to think about his response. Watching him work, she considered how what she was going to do would be hard for him. That night at the hotel, Chanlina read a message on her phone from Mother. The message talked about the problems of managing the family shop and her sister's time in school. Chanlina wanted to call her, but doubted she could prevent herself from telling Mother what she was about to do. She lay on the bed, holding her phone, and wondering how quickly she could get a new job and keep sending money home. Chanlina acted on the last day of the trip. Despite Mr. E's skill, the negotiations had not succeeded, and they were returning to China without an agreement. She waited until the last day, because looking for her would be harder if, if Mr. E and Big Lin had to catch a flight. They were to have breakfast before checking out of the hotel. Chanlina called Mr. E to say she was not feeling well and would have to come down later. She waited in her room for 15 minutes, her heart feeling like it was trying to break out of her chest. Then she grabbed her bags, went to the stairwell, and ran down the stairs onto the street. Chanlina didn't feel the cold. She was sweating. Calling a car beforehand would have been risky, so she had to find one now. She scanned the sea of cars and hailed an old-fashioned taxi. The cab, its paint peeling and rust showing beneath, pulled over. Chanlina settled inside the cab, which smelled of body odor and perfume. As they drove along, she found herself again rehearsing her words. There was no need to practice now. They were not hard English words to say, but she kept repeating them to herself. I am from China. I wish to defect. I have information. She reached inside her purse to grasp the thumb drive. She squeezed it as if that could get the cab there faster. So where are you from? The cab driver asked. China, she said, only half listening. Then she paused and spoke again. No, Cambodia. I'm from Cambodia. She could say that now. That was home. A visiting? Here on business? Yes, business. How long are you in town for? I don't know. That was the truth. The driver asked her more questions about how she liked the city and what she was going to do during her stay. She answered vaguely, still rehearsing in her minds, the words she planned to say at the foreign missions office. You have kids back home? No. The cab was stalled in traffic. When would they get there? Her heart was still trying to break through her ribs. I have three kids, he gestured at photos on the dashboard. They make a lot of trouble, he laughed. He chattered away, telling stories about his children. Then he asked, so you have any family back home? My mother and two sisters. He nodded. I have a sister and a brother. He paused. My mom died last year. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was real tough. She was sick for a long time, you know? She was strong, but she just couldn't take care of herself anymore. She needed help to take a shower, go to the bathroom, eat. It was real hard. It ended up that me and my brother and sister had to go to the doctor and ask him to help her, so she wouldn't go through it anymore. John Lena did not understand. You asked the doctor to help her? Why wasn't the doctor helping her? 
You said she was sick. The driver glanced at her in the rearview mirror. No, what I mean is, he was helping her before, but she wasn't getting better. And she wasn't happy either. So it ended up that we asked the doctor to give her pills. Pills? Yeah. You know, so she could die. Chanlina was not sure she understood the driver's English. The doctor gave your mother pills so she could die? Yeah, that's right. It wasn't easy, but, I mean, she just wasn't happy anymore. She shouldn't have to live like that. And you can do that? A doctor can do that? Yeah. He looked at her again in the mirror. It's a free country. Chanlina leaned back in her seat and thought about this. She stared out the cab's window at the street, at the snow and the graying people shuffling past. She felt her heartbeat slow down. The sweat on her scalp and face and back cooled. The sunrise on the Tonle Sap again flashed through her mind. Then she spoke. I'm sorry, can you take me back to the hotel? The driver turned around. What? No, it's fine, it's fine. I'll pay you. Just take me back to where you picked me up. He shrugged. Okay. He moved the cab over so they could make the next turn. While the cab idled at a red light, Chanlina rolled down the window. Now she felt the cold. It scraped against her wet face as she leaned out the window. She saw a sewer grate by the, by the curb. She took the thumb drive out of her purse and dropped it down the grate. It clattered away. Chanlina rolled up the window, sat back, and tried to think of the excuses she would give Mr. Yi. Now, Amy Murphy will be speaking on her honorable mention piece, Worth. The judges liked how this piece illustrates human life in, at all stages in a simple and compelling manner. So my piece is real tiny. It's real little. I didn't realize how hard oil paints would be to use um, when I purchased the canvas that was this small. <laughs> so the quote that I kept coming back to time and again while brainstorming ideas for my painting was from a, an apologetics talk that I heard years ago. I don't remember who said it or what the context was, but it stuck with me. Our worth doesn't lie in what you do, but rather in what you are. I kept coming back to it, and of course, the what matters. Our nature as human beings is one that is uniquely rational, and that is what so profoundly matters. We don't ever lose this nature, no matter what good or evil or big things or nothingness we do in our lifetimes. But that whatness also makes us whose. I don't mean the little community of people on a tiny dust black planet who are bamboozled by the Grinch or found by Horton the Elephant, though a person is a person no matter how small also kept popping into my mind. What I mean is, in our rational nature, we gain a sense of selfhood. We are not just what's, but who's. We are human beings, and as human beings, we are inimitable, unrepeatable, incommunicable. As such, our worth is unchangeable. That is what I was trying to convey in my piece, Worth. The painting shows little, perhaps remarkable, perhaps unremarkable moments in the life of a rather unfamous woman who has cerebral palsy. As a blastocyst in the womb of her mother, she had inherent dignity and worth and was worthy of protection. And as we follow her life through all sorts of life stages, as an embryo, a fetus, an infant, a toddler, a schoolgirl learning to walk with her braces, a collegian excelling in her studies, a pregnant mother herself, and an aged woman more dependent and in need of care, she is always human, 
always having that dignity inherent in her being, always worthy of protection. I tried to convey the sameness of the girl through the use of oil paints in each tiny snapshot of her life, in contrast with her changing surroundings, which are instead painted in watercolor, which is very hard to do on canvas. I'm not sure if you've tried. <coughs> to convey the more ephemeral and passing nature in comparison with the infinite abyss that lies within this one single human. As I close the program, I would just like to thank um, everyone for coming tonight and all the brilliant writers and artists that are published in the magazine, um, everyone that presented, um, and all the review board members for helping making all these decisions. Um, this issue really touched my heart by the relevance and wide range of consistent life issues covered in it. Um, now let's share and rehumanize. I would also like to remind everyone to check out all the winning and honorable mention pieces um, around, um, as well as grab a refreshment, check out our activity table, um, snap, snap a pic with the teal carpet and rehumanize banner, and mingle with each other and the writers and artists. Um, as well as I want to announce, um, we're having some more artsy events this um, weekend. There are two sessions tomorrow in the Rehumanized Room. Sarah Tang will be doing creative art therapy and Stacy will be doing a poetry session. Um, and Maria Oswald and I will be facilitating a round table discussion on Sunday with, about arts and the consistent life ethic. Um, now, to end the program, um, we will be playing um, Krista Corbella's first place song, I'll Love You. Thank you again for coming. Words, they fail me. Words, they don't come naturally, so I'll sing for you. Words, they fail me. Words, they don't come easily, so I'll sing for you. I la 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 love you. I la 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 love you. I la 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 love I la 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 love you. I la 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 love you. I la 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 love you. Words escape me. Words they don't come perfectly. So I'll write for you. Words escape me. Words they come with melody, so I'll play for you. A la 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 love 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 you. A la 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 love. I'm lost for words and loving hurts, but I won't change a thing. Say goodbyes and when you fly, we'll hear the angels sing. A la 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 love you. A la 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 love you. A la 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 love you. I'll sacrificially love you. I'll selflessly love you. I'll vulnerably love you. I'll humbly love you. I'll sacrificially love you. I'll selflessly love you. I'll vulnerably love you. I'll 
I'll fearlessly love you. A la 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 love you. A la 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 love you. A la 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 love you. Oh, a la 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 love you. A la 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 love you.